Uh, right, so first of all, thank you very much um, well, to LSC Stats, uh, so officially to Angelos and Costas, because you're the scientific committee, uh, for organizing the conference, but not only that, for actually inviting me, which is even better for me. Um, and thank you for Winton for hosting, uh, hosting uh, the conference. Right, so I want to... So I think, if I remember, I didn't check, but I think the title is slightly different to uh, what I put in the program. It's the same keywords, right? But the thing is, when I started writing um, the slides, uh, then I saw that I was the last speaker, so I thought at some point, I started adding things, adding more slides and more slides, because I thought, it's 4.30, after a long day, you might be very thirsty, of knowledge, at least. Uh, so I'm adding, I added loads of things. Uh, but of course, there's a chance I will not be able to talk about everything. So uh, essentially, there will be two parts. I will focus on the first part, and the second part is just to show some very nice pictures, which I like. Um, right. So this is based on uh, this is this one. Yes. Ah. This is based on uh, basically two papers and a few other projects we have in the pipe with Blanca Harvard, I, who's a who's starting in Kings in September, Aita Mugruza, who's a PhD student, and Peter Tankov, who's in uh, uh, NSIO now, right? Always oh, uh, Paris. Yes. It's the same. In... Right. Uh, and so what will I talk about? I will talk about rough volatility. Um, so the very good thing, I should all, again thank the organizers for having Stefano in the morning. Um, because basically he said a lot in, the, in his introduction, so there's not much I have to say anymore. Um, and actually, it turns out when you see more, the first two, three slides, it looks like, well, it looks like Stefano and I actually communicated a lot, because all his introduction, I didn't put any of it in there. Right? So it's a perfect uh, combination. We, it looks like we actually communicated. Almost. So, as I said, I want to talk about raw volatility, in particular pricing, and a little bit of hedging. So in order to, to simplify things, at least to make everybody happy, and since we are in a democratic country, let's agree that volatility is rough. Right? This is democracy, we all agree on that. Since we all agree, it makes everything simpler. Right? If you don't agree, ah, ask Stefano. Right, so volatility is rough. What do I mean by this is, so it's, it's a fairly recent story, which somehow, it's, it's an old story, but somehow has been revived in the past few years. Uh, so there are two papers, really. So the, the first one by, okay, I don't know why I put et al. It's very not nice for the other co-authors. So it's Jim Gatherall. Uh, Mathieu Rosenbaum and Thibaut Gesson, who basically analyzed a certain number of uh, indices and stocks. And Michael Bennetson, Mikko Pakanen, and the third one. That's why you should always, it's because I forgot who the third one is. Asger Lunde, right. Um, so what, do, what did they say? They said that take, no, not this button. Sigma. I have a stock price, or an index, or whatever you want, a commodity. Sigma is the instantaneous volatility. Assume for now that you can observe it. Right? Um, if you look at a time little t, the... No touching the screen, yes. Uh, the instantaneous volatility at time t plus delta, you take the log, minus log of sigma t, so that's the increment of the log volatility over a short period of time delta, right? You take the parallel Q, you take expectation, and you look at many indices, either indices or stocks. They also look at commodity, some commodities, uh, gold, I think, and a couple of other things. And they observe this relationship, now, nah, wrong button again, that this is proportional to delta to the power H times Q. K is a constant. We don't really care about constant today. So it's delta to the power h times q. And in pretty much all the examples they could think they could find, h is roughly 0 0.1. Um, what, now, if you 
And this is true for pretty much all the values of Q as well that you take. So first of all, a quick remark. Sigma, of course, you cannot observe it directly, but you have a certain number of proxies that you can take. There may be statistical noise and so on, which I will not talk about here. Uh, I'm happy to provide more detail or you look at their papers. But essentially, that's a relation that seems to be holding in a very general number of cases. Um, so now, if I want to build a model which is consistent with that observation, well, if I say, well, sigma is, say, or well, log sigma is Brown in motion, I will have this relationship, but with h is one half. If I take log sigma to be fractional Brown in motion, and fractional Brown in motion has this uh, little Hurst parameter, this coefficient h between zero and one, I will have this relationship, uh, with h be being the Hurst exponent, and in case you're not familiar, h is between zero and one. A smaller than one, h is one half the standard Brown motion. A smaller than one half is depending on how you see it, either short memory models or it means that the paths are rougher in terms of uh, sampled path than standard Brown motion. H greater than one half is long memory process and the path is smoother. Um, so that's why it's called rough volatility models and the rough terms means that the path of you know, the process with holder regularity less than one half are a bit more rough, less smooth. Um, and they also show that there are a certain number of uh, very nice statistical properties for forecasting as well, uh, which I will not talk about here. If you want more details, so I believe, I think the slides might get available online later. Uh, yes, maybe. So if there are, uh, there, there's a very nice website, which is called Rough Volatility Network. Um, I have to do a bit of advertising because Stefano forgot. Um, and the point of... <laughs> Sneaky. Uh, the point of this Ralph Volatility Net Network is to gather all the people who work on this topic uh, from many different points of view, statistics, pricing, uh, <coughs> machine learning now, soon. Uh, and to gather all the information we have about it, papers, uh, conferences, seminars, and everything. So feel free to have a look at it. Uh, right. Okay, so the goal of this talk is in this class of rough volatility models, which I will uh, present a little bit more in detail soon, is to see how we can price efficiently, well, both pricing and hedging, efficiently, so not options on the underlying, so not vanilla options, but options on the volatility or options on the variance. Uh, options on the index, so standard vanilla options that were done previously uh, in other papers. Here we only want to focus on uh, options on variance, options real variance of VIX, VIX miles. Okay. So that's my introduction. Right. Ah, no, no, I have, a, I have another slide of introduction. But it's the same. <laughs> this is the motivation somehow. There's a lot of motivation on rough volatility, uh, depending on who you talk to. So if you talk to the rough volatility community who's more, who, more in the statistics approach, like Matthew Rosenbaum or Mick Cooper Cannon, their motivation is a market microstructure foundation, market microstructure uh, reasons to introduce rough volatility. The way I see it is from the option pricing point of view, which is basically this graph tells everything about it. If you take the S&P and you look at the options on the, ah, wrong button again, sorry. If you look at the options on the S&P, so C is the call option, I look at the, the skew, Right, so the, the derivative with respect to the strike, add the money, and I plot this as a function of the maturity, remaining maturity, right? And so that was on, uh, on August 14th, 2013. So the dots are the actual value quoted on the CBOE website. 
which are end of the day chords, but okay, that's good enough estimate. And I try to fit a function. If I fit a function, that would be the function I get. Psi of tau is some constant, again, I don't care about constant here, tau to the power alpha. And alpha here is minus 0 0.407. There's no, nothing complicated. There's no heavy math, nothing very fancy here, right? This is just a set of points and, uh, and a Paolo function that I fit. Turns out that there, there are two papers that date back from uh, 10 years ago now, even less, where they show that in a class of rough volatility models, which again I will talk about later, but think of it as standard stochastic volatility models where the volatility is driven by a fraction of Brownian motion. So Heston, but you replace the Brownian motion of the volatility by a fraction or any model of this sort. Then what uh, these two papers showed was that as tau goes to zero, so as the remaining maturity goes to zero, this at the moment q exactly behaves like this, where h so tau to the h minus one half, where h is actually the highest exponent of the fraction of Brownian motion driving the volatility. And now if you do heavy math, where h minus one half equals alpha, alpha being this value, it means that h is 0 0.09, which is close enough to 0 0.1. The point is, it kind of relates the same model to look at this option pricing part, so under the Q measure, and these estimates which are done under the P measure. So it seems like the same model or the same class of model, rough volatility models, are able to capture both the behaviors under P and the behavior under Q. Okay. <coughs> so I said I only want to look at options on the variance, or option on volatility, or derivatives and variance, realized variance. So I have this slide. This slide is um, very simple. There's a lot of notations, but that's the point. This slide is supposed to introduce the notations. But it, this is a very straightforward slide. The point is that's, that will always be my model, right? So ds is sigma s db. And from now on, s, which is my underlying, say the s and p, for example, I don't care really about it anymore because I'm not pricing options on the volatility, I'm pricing options on the variance, so what I'm really interested in is the sigma here, which is the instantaneous volatility. And so, in this toy example, sigma is what? Is some constant, capital Xi, e to the xt. And x is what? Is any centered, con continuous, ah, okay, continuous Gaussian process, I can define this Z, which is the conditional expectation of X, and this is, of course, a martingale Gaussian with, with this uh, second, second moment. C, which, depending on what you choose, you can compute it uh, explicitly. This is the central tool, so it's, and that's, see, we communicated, this is exactly the same notation as Stefano, Xi, which is the forward variance. So Stefano had a capital T here on top, but it's the same object. Why is that forward variance, which is what? Which is the conditional expectation of the, the future instantaneous variance. And in this model, you can compute it explicitly. That's not uh, very exciting, this expression, but you can compute it. As Stefano said, he said a lot of things. So it's a martingale. Of course, it's log normal. So I can compute the conditional expectation, the conditional variance. That's fine. Now, if I'm interested in pricing an option on this object, on this instantaneous forward variance, which is just, that's my payoff, right? So maturity capital T naught. This is my underlying, which is a martingale, so that's fine. Minus, minus this tri positive part, and I conditional on time little t, which is my pricing time. Well, I think xi here is just a, Martingale, continuous, log normal, this is just black shoes, really, right? But S becomes a Xi, so I can write everything uh, directly uh, without um, any complications. 
Now, the interesting part is the hedging, and against the hedging is the same as Black Scholes, right? So PT is the, the price of the option at time little t, and this is a standard Black Scholes type of hedging. Now, the interesting part here is, of course, the underlying is not S, is the Xi, which is the forward variance. And so I'm just repeating what Stefano said uh, that was introduced by Dupier in this uh, paper in 93, but which was really promoted and developed fully by Bergomi in a series of paper, which is it makes sense to actually consider as underlying not necessarily the instantaneous volatility, so not model the instantaneous volatility, but model the forward variance, which is actually observable. And if it's observable, then the hedging makes sense. And the hedging is not, of course, not with respect to S, but hedging with respect, with respect to Xi. So this is a very toy example. The whole point is to say, well, my hedging, I can actually hedge directly using this Xi, which is the, the forward variance curve. And I can actually observe it. One can uh, uh, debate that a little bit because you don't observe the whole curve, you observe points on the curve, but okay. Modular interpolation, you actually observe the curve. Okay, but that's a very simple example. What I want to look at is something a bit more complicated. Um, <coughs> which essentially are models of this form. So sigma t, again, is my instantaneous volatility. is some constant, which I can ignore here, e to the xt, but now xt has a specific form. So it's not any continuous Gaussian uh, process. It's a Volterra process. So it's an integral of some kernel against the Brownian motion. Um, W can be d-dimensional. Why do we want potentially several dimensions? Because, as uh, Stefano said, you can have different, a certain number of factors that can uh, play a role when you price and when you calibrate. The Bergomi n-factor or Stefano n-factors. So W can be multidimensional. Um, okay, this is just a technical condition to make sure that the integral exists. This button? Yes. Okay, so now once I have this dynamics, this model for my instantaneous variance, I can write down dynamics for my forward variance curve. So my forward variance curve, Xi, which is so I am at time little t, and I'm looking forward in time at u. This has log normal dynamics with this, again, this kernel g. And for now, G is really anything, modulo uh, integrability conditions. I can write it in this, uh, in this form, um, just to highlight the fact that it's look normal here. So at time capital T, is a value at time little t, and this dolly on that exponential. I will I just write here because I, I will use this notation later. This button again. So a simple example. That's been, um, well, that was the first type of rough volatility model really presented and used. Now we're trying to push it a bit further, but it's the rough Bergomi model where I want this to be a fraction of Brownian motion. So G basically is a Paolo kernel. Paolo kernel meaning G of UT is U minus T to the H minus one half, where the H really corresponds to the Hurst exponent of a fraction of Brownian motion. So essentially with this Paolo kernel, this object is not exactly a fraction of Brownian motion, but looks like a fraction of Brownian motion. And if I just uh, write this down again, these are the dynamics of the forward variance. So this is exactly the rough Bergomi model. Okay, so what do I want to do with this kind of model? I want to look at the VIX and options on the VIX. This is the, the ultimate goal of this talk. Um, since we're here, I have a quote for you. The goal is you have to guess who said that, since it's the VIX. <coughs> that was from November 2017, 
is VIX is like Bitcoin, it is misunderstood, and we don't trade it much. Do I have any idea who said that? I could be anybody, but... We don't trade it much. Yeah, we don't, we don't trade it much. So the person who said that was David Harding, who's, uh, I guess there are people from Winton. So he's the, CEO, the founder and the CEO of uh, Winton. Um, so I have to apologize because I'm, well, no, I apologize. That's you know, our uh, mission, Stefano and I, to convince you that actually you know, VIX is still uh, interesting. Um, so it turns out he's not completely, well, I shouldn't say that, it's recording. Uh, he's not completely wrong <laughs> in the sense that it is a very, misunderstood object. If you look at uh, his behavior, in January, the value of the VIX was 30, now it's 15. Uh, the inverse of the VIX, which was called the XIV, uh, was discontinued uh, two months ago because basically it completely crashed. It was a uh, Credit Suisse object um, uh, derivative and crashed completely, so they, they, they stopped it uh, two months ago. So. VIX is misunderstood. Yeah. Oh, I let you finish. The sentence, what do you mean by misunderstood? It's, it, it's just like that. It's the market. The behavior, the behavior. I agree. Yeah. But yeah. the market is very volatile. And, but, okay. I don't, what do you mean by misunderstood? It's, I'm quoting. <laughs> I mean, trading derivatives on VIX uh, is yet to be better understood by the fact that the VIX is 30. One month and 15 the other month, it's, it's just yeah, there is, slide, I think the whole point is extremely volatile. Okay. And so it's not easy to... <coughs> right. So, nonetheless, we... There are, I mean, VIX and derivatives on the VIX still are around $4 billion of asset under management, which is not the biggest market, but it's still a decent market where you can make some money. So, and some people did make some money and lost it all also. But, right, so VIX options. So this is one slide and Stefano had a longer version of uh, VIX. So I will be short, but the VIX really, so VIX squared is written here. Is what is the expectation? So capital theta is one month. So the VIX squared at time capital T is the realized variance between time capital T and capital T plus one month. And I'll take the expectation conditional on time T. Right? So it's the realized variance over one month. One. Um, but if I put this expectation inside the integral, then expectation of sigma squared U conditional on FT, this is exactly psi T U which is my forward variance curve. So really, the VIX squared at time capital T is an integrated version of my forward variance curve. And so what we're interested in is to price options on the VIX, or on the VIX squared, so F, which is my payoff of this integral. So the, the standard example where we'll do pneumatics on is if I look at the call option, which would be f of z is square root of z minus a strike positive part, because all the options are on the VIX and not the, on the VIX squared. Okay. So if I want to look at uh, options on the VIX, well, I can just uh, class it classically. I take the expectation of my payoff conditional on time little t, which is my pricing time. Of course, this, I can actually write it as a functional of my pricing time and the whole curve, the whole forward variance curve, seen at time little t, with all maturities ranging from capital T up to t plus one month. And this f, actually, I can write it explicitly as an expectation of some curve, and this e is my dollar on that exponential. Okay, so that, uh, there's nothing really complicated here. This is just writing down the formula. <coughs> so, in this hedging pricing, there would be two things. The first result is theoretical 
in the sense that, okay, that's the theorem. We did not actually implement it, so we did not actually test it numerically. Uh, that's in the, on the to-do list, uh, which is a Martingale representation theorem. There's nothing very surprise, surprising. So the price at time capital T is the price at time little t plus okay, some integral over the life of the contract and some big derivative. Right? So I don't want to go through any detail here. The whole point is all these derivatives are in terms of what? In terms of what? The burn in motion which drives the, um, the volatility process and the whole forward balance curve. So, and this dx is a fresher derivative because f is a functional of the whole forward balance curve, which is a path. So this whole theorem, really, the whole point is to say hedging is the same as in a standard black Scholes type of case or Markovian models, where now the underlying, of course, the stock price process itself is not Markovian, right? But as uh, was pointed out by Stefan already, is that if I look at the stock price and the instantaneous value of the, and the whole forward balance curve, the, this whole thing is Markovian. So then it makes sense that I have some Martinian representation theorem involving the whole curve, involving the whole forward balance curve. Right. And the proof, we'll skip it. Now, if I look at pricing, so pricing we did it by Monte Carlo. Um, because, well, we didn't know how to do it otherwise. That's a good reason. Okay, so if I just re recall it, that's my price at time little t, which is this big expectation, which I write it as dysfunctional. So if I do Monte Carlo, the problem is I have this integral, so I need to discretize it. So we tried, we actually tried two discretization schemes. One is a rectangle scheme, one is a trapezoidal scheme. There's nothing really fancy here. You know, you discretize this integral and, uh, you know, you just do rectangles, right? So these are the left points and, uh, and, and then this is the dollar on that exponential where, sorry, which came from here. So when I discretize this, I have the value at some, at the left point of the rectangle here, and then I have the, in, some of the integrals. And this is this formula. You can do the same for trapezoidal scheme, which is uh, not more complicated, but it's just uh, a bit longer. Right. Yes. Why is it a functional of only the forward curve from capital T to capital T plus theta? Well, but it's seen at time little t. Yes, it is seen at time little t. So this psi t of u is the expectation conditional on time little t because you have this conditional expectation here. Okay, okay. Yes. Right. <coughs> so the first result is a convergence rate, which is not surprising, actually. Uh, it's just the proof is a little bit more involved, but the rectangular scheme, so if you have uh, an equidistant partition, so between t and uh, t plus theta, then the rate of convergence is 1 over n, where n is the number of uh, time step. Uh, for the trapezoidal scheme, this is 1 over n squared. It's, yeah, you can forget about the constant here. There's nothing surprising here. This is standard. Uh, just you know, proving it is a few more lines, but this, uh, this works the same. Of course, I hide a few things here, right? So there are some uh, conditions on, the, in particular, the regularity of the kernel. Actually, not the regularity, but how singular the kernel is. Because if you remember in the Ralph Bragomi example, the kernel GUT is U minus T to the power H minus one half. But H is negative, meaning that when U is equal to T, it's singular. And the roughness of the process com comes from the singularity. So I can't take any kind of singularity, but in pretty much all the examples we might be interested in, 
it will actually hold. So in particular, in the fraction by enumeration case, um, the hidden assumptions are satisfied. Now if we look at some graphs, yes. So this is for a call option on the VIX. So that's my payoff, right? So X in this uh, framework here was the VIX squared. So if I look at the call option on the VIX, this is square root of X minus the strike positive part. Um, and I have a certain number of parameters. So H is 0 0.1 because that seems to be, a, there's no calibration here, right? But that seems to be a, a good value for the parameter from the different calibrations and estimations that you can find in other papers. Uh, time, initial time is zero, maturity is one year, theta 0.1, I think it should be one month. Um, it's a one month, but shrunk to the size of the page. Um, and we took a flat forward variance curve. It's not completely realistic, but it just made uh, the computation simpler here. And what you observe, well, the graphs, the left graph is not, uh, the left graphs are not very exciting in the sense the top ones are rectangular scheme, bottom ones are tri uh, trapezoidal schemes. Not very exciting in the sense, okay, it converges. That's the, the short way. On the right, you get the errors in log scale, which uh, so this is in terms of log n, so you've got, uh, this is linear in log n, and this is roughly quadratic. But of course, there's, uh, we could have run it um, with more values, but uh, basically, numerically illustrate this and this. Okay. So now, I had the options on the VIX. What I want to look at, the next step, is the, the VIX implied volatility smile, which is what? Which is the same as, you know, you have your vanilla options on the, on the S&P. To get the implied volatility, you take black shoes, you compute the price in black shoes, you equate the two, you get the implied volatility. You can do the same here, right? Where I have my option on the VIX, I assume that the VIX is black shoes type, I compute the price, I equate both, and I get my implied volatility. If I do this, and I plot as a function of the strike for different values of the parameters, ah, it's flat. Um, so before commenting on that, if you look at data, so you saw some uh, graphs this morning by Stefano, here are other graphs, these are imply volatilities from the VIX. So usually it's increasing. So the different uh, maturities, right, as a function of the strikes, they're all increasing. That's, okay, there are periods of uh, time where uh, it's not increasing, um, but that's a fairly common feature. Here, it's flat. What does it mean? Well, again, I'm uh, repeating what Stefano said. It's not surprising because here the underlying Xi is not log normal, but it's an integral of log normal over a period of one month, and one month is small, right, 0 0.12, which is actually very close to log normal. So if you think of black shows, if I equate uh, an option price under black shows to an option price computed from a log normal model, of course, the implied volatility will be, will be flat for a fixed maturity. So meaning what? Meaning that uh, as exciting as all these computations in theorem are, it's fairly pointless, at least when it comes to calibrating the fixed mine. So we need to push a bit further. But, and to push a bit further, uh, but of course, everything we did so far will be useful. Hopefully. Okay, so that's the market data, right? So now what do I want? I want to have a model for my instantaneous volatility. <coughs> well, first, which has some roughness, right? Because as we all agreed in the first place, volatility is, is rough, right? That was a common agreement. So I want roughness. But I want something which is not 
just log normal. Because if it's just log normal, then I know I will have flat smiles, which, which doesn't work. So I need to have something a bit more fancy. So this morning, see, there's a lot of communication. Stefano presented uh, one model. But since he didn't say he quickly es escaped when he talked about uh, my version, I quickly escaped uh, his bullet point as well. So we follow here an alternative route, which we deem is better, but is debatable, um, based on what's called modulated Volterra processes. Right? So Stefano's point was to say, well, I can introduce many factors, uh, and in the rough Bergomi, it's just exponentials, some of it, uh, exponentials of sums. Maybe uh, we can take something else. Uh, and he had a general ca characterization of functions or functionals f uh, that would be valid. Uh, and he showed one example where indeed you, you get a non flat smiles. Um, here we want to look at something a bit different, which are models of this form. So sigma t is the, always the same, right? So I drop the constant here to make uh, the slide simpler. Sigma t my instantaneous volatility is exponential xt. But now xt is not Gaussian anymore. xt is a little bit more complicated. So it's an integral. So I started from infi minus infinity. If you want to start from zero, it's fine. It's just really for convenience here. Um, if you forget about this root gamma s, this is exactly the same as before, right? Standard Brownian motion, maybe multidimensional, with some kernel, with a singularity at the origin, and that's it. But there I'm adding a square root of gamma, which is what? So gamma, we try to please everybody, right? So we pleased people from statistics. Uh, now we have to please people from the affine community. Uh, so gamma is an affine process. Positive, of course. Um, independent of W, because otherwise uh, we, don't know, we don't really know what to do. Uh, and of course, because gamma is, uh, is, is not a process, this will not be Gaussian in general. Some examples, if you want gamma to be continuous, you can take CIR process. If you want uh, other things, you can take Levy-driven OU process. And actually, in the numerics we have would be for Levy-driven OU processes. But in principle, you can take any fine gamma process. Now, that's the big theorem. So in a theorem, that's the first time I used that, where I have two colors. That was exhausting to do all these colors. Black is same as before, and blue is the new stuff. So blue is whatever uh, we get from by introducing this uh, additional parameter, this additional process in the story. <coughs> All right, so gamma is what? Gamma is an affine process, conservative, positive, time homogeneous. So, you know, example, think of CIR process, Levy processes, Levy-driven OU processes, and there's a lot of them. We assume, well, no, actually, we don't assume. Then we can actually, we have an expression for this infinite dimensional moment generating function, if you wish, conditional time t. And this is, has the form exponential of gamma at time little t, because I condition on time little t, times phi plus psi, which is exact, if you're a bit familiar with the fine process, this is the same as. Uh, the standard theory in the fine processes. Right? And psi and phi satisfy a system of Riccati equations. Well, phi is just the integral of f of psi, and psi is really a Riccati equation uh, bec because r is a quadratic plus some integral, and f is linear plus some integral. So m and mu are two <coughs> Levy measures. Because, of course, general fine process, there's one part, so psi, r, psi, there, there. So mu correspond to the state dependent, is the levy measure corresponding to the state dependent jumps. And m is the levy measure corresponding to the state independent jumps. Right? There are always two type of measures, and this is a general framework. 
Okay, once I have this, then I have my dynamics for the forward variance curve. Uh, and there are, yes, so if I write it in exponential form, I have this integral, which again, if you forget about gamma, this is exactly the same as before, the first integral, right? Xi is exponential of integral of the kernel times Brian motion. The psi actually, if r is not there, is two times, the, this is a quadratic variation, so I have the same thing, and that's the new part which depends on the gamma. Right. So this is really exactly the same as before, but we have this additional gamma process. You can write in differential form if you wish, with the continuous smarting it part and compensating job. So that's the general result. The proof is not very complicated, but okay. If I look at an example, the example we have is you take gamma to be Levy-driven OU, so L is some Levy process, and I have some mean reversion there. I can compute everything in closed form. Again, this is my general formula. The phi and the psi, which I'm not writing, uh, which I'm not detailing, are in terms of the Levy exponent of uh, the, uh, the, the Levy driver here. And again, I'm just repeating what I had before. I have dynamics for the forward variance curve, which is this same as before kind of fractional brain immersion part with this additional gamma plus a big bit uh, uh, with all the jumps. Okay, and uh, for the pneumatics, we assume the simplest case we could think of for psi is just uh, exponential, one-sided exponential jumps. Why we do that? Because it's finite variation, so all the integrals over the jumps becomes finite, so it makes uh, all the computation simpler. Okay, now to price of X option, I will uh, I will skip the details of uh, the actual details of the computation. Well, we use the trick, this contour variant trick, which is since we have an integral of a log normal, we can take as control variant, taking the log outside, and this was used for Asian options a long time ago. So we take control variant log of uh, um, of the integral of Gaussian, which is easier than the integral of log normal. Um, so, I'm, ah, so I'm skipping the, the exact detail of the computation. The good thing, at least in this numerical example, and what makes really the computation quicker, so all the computation and calibration are done on my laptop, and which is hidden over there. If you look at it, it's a very old and uh, bad laptop. Uh, but it's very fast. And the reason why we have these finite variation jumps, again, is because all these integrals become just sums, so uh, you can do everything quickly. Okay, so these are, I mean, I have yeah, many slides with, uh, so we take the VIX mice, so on the right are the options on the VIX, on the left are the corresponding implied volatilities. Um, we don't calibrate all the SMIs one by one. We have the same parameters for all the surface. So, which means what? Which means that overall we have, I forgot, five or six parameters, maximum. Right. So it's the same set of parameters. Actually, I'm cheating a little bit. At first, we calibrated smile, smile by smile, maturity by maturity. Turns out the parameters were basically the same. Right. So then we redid it again with the, all, the, all the smiles at the same time, the whole surface or discretized surface at the same time. And what you observe is, of course, Option prices, when you look at calibration, it always works uh, very well, right? So that's uh, not very convincing. It's a lot more convincing to look at implied volatilities. And basically, it fits extremely well. Of course, there are a couple of points uh, that are not perfect. Um, so this is, I forgot, this is, uh, okay, I forgot to indicate the maturity, sorry. So this is probably, one week, one week, two weeks, 
one month, two months, and it goes up to five months, I think. So some points are not amazingly well calibrated. These points, in particular to the left, so they're now extremely well calibrated, and now it's actually painful to try and calibrate them. But after suffering for a long time, what we decided was maybe we don't care about these points. And that's a little bit cheating, you might say. But it turns out that, and I was even more convinced this morning because on Stefano's slides, there's no uplift on the left. And it turns out if you actually, so because this data was provided to us by some hedge fund, um, and problem, there was no liquidity indication for these strikes. And it turns out that actually these points are very illiquid. So, you know, there's always the concept of missing data or very non-liquid data, whether or not you should include them. Maybe not. Anyhow, we included them, and overall the calibration works pretty, really fine. And again, this is all the maturities at the same time, the whole surface at once. Okay, so the conclusion is what? The conclusion is that we want a model that is able to capture the roughness of volatility. Roughness of volatility, maybe there are other ways, but the good way we've found so far is to have volatility with paths that are less regular than Brownian motion. Also, hold the regularity less than one half. Um, of course, the ultimate goal is not to do just calibration of the S&P smile or calibration of the VIX smile, is to do both at the same time, so to do joint calibration. Um, we did not do that in the paper, but it's in progress, and it seems to be working well. But okay, I can't promise yet. Um, and of course, if you want to have VIX smiles which are not flat, you need to have a model where the, instant, the, the forward variance curve is not log normal or not close to log normal. If you have something close to log normal, then you get VIX smiles which are flat or close to flat. Um, of course, the numerical example was with this Levy-driven OU process. We're, for example, working now on trying to find other processes that might be working better or that might be more amenable to calibration or easier to calibrate. It, it's actually not complicated to calibrate. Uh, the notebook, so it's written in Python. The Python notebook should be available soon as soon as I clean it up. Um, but the code is simple and it's fairly easy to calibrate. Right. So, I officially have five minutes or something like that, yeah. right? So, that's the second part of the talk. Doesn't mean I'm gonna use another hour, right? Relax. Um, it's some, so yeah, I did write if time permits. So time permits a little bit. Uh, the, whole, the, the whole point of the second part is not to go through any detail, it's just to, to give a very quick idea of the numerical methods that uh, have been developed and we're still working on for these raw volatility models. Uh, so let's say we're only interested in S&P smiles here, and you have your stock price and you have your volatility, which is rough. We don't have characteristic functions except in one uh, model, this rough Heston by Mathieu Rosenbaum and Omar and Oish. Otherwise, we don't have characteristic functions. So we can't use any FFT or fully transform type of approach. The stock price or the, the couple stock price volatility is not Markovian. So we can't use PDEs. So then we have to do Monte Carlo, right? So Monte Carlo, the problem is we have to simulate a Gaussian process not burn in motion. So less key decomposition one can do, but it's very slow. So the best scheme until a few months ago uh, was this so-called hybrid scheme by Mick Cooper Cannon and co-authors, who's also in Imperial, um, which, which actually is a way of discretizing fractional burn in motion by separating the singular part of the kernel and the non-singular part of the kernel. And it's very efficient. But what we try to do here is 
to go back to kind of all principles like Donska, uh, Donska Lampety type of discretization um, and weak convergence of um, of um, random walks to Brownian motion, but to apply it to rough volatility. To apply it first to fraction of Brownian motion and then to rough volatility. So I will not go into any detail, but we consider general forms of dynamics where, so X, I apologize for this, here X is my log stock price, so log of S, and here I forget about forward variances. I can recast everything in terms of forward variance processes, but here it's simpler to write it that way. V is my instantaneous variance, so sigma squared, and it's, I can write in general form like this, where Y is a neutral diffusion. Think of it as a standard brown motion, right? It can be more general, but standard Brownian motion. I have an integral against dy, so this is essentially my fraction of Brownian motion. Right? This singular kernel and this integral, so this is my fraction of Brownian motion. And phi is a continuous functional, say exponential, right? which takes me back exactly to the framework before. But in fact, it can be a lot more general. And what we do here is, okay, there are several examples. What we do here is going back to Donska is to construct a random walk that converges to the process. So for, we need that for, for, we need to construct that for Y, ah, for Y, but that's easy, right? Because Y is an into diffusion, so we know how to construct a random walk converging. And then we need to translate this to an approximation for V and then we need to plug it back into the X to get an approximation for this one. Turns out that if you go back to the papers by Donska, Lampati, and all the, the refinements that have been done over the past decades, you can actually do everything. So I'm, I'm skipping everything, right? It's just to give you a rough idea that it is possible to extend these constructions and to construct some random walk converging to the stock price. A good, and you can prove convergence uh, again depending on on the conditions, on the kernels. Uh, you have conditions in different <clears throat> in different spaces, but one can prove everything. One can prove some everything, some kind of convergence of some random walks to the process you're interested in, to these rough volatility processes. Once you have this, the good thing is. I apologize, it was a bit cut there. Um, you can test that, you can implement that, you can basically construct a Monte, Carlo, a Monte Carlo scheme based on this approximation, and it turns out it works extremely well. So all these graphs only say it, it looks very fine. The one graph that is nice is this one, which is these are the computational time ratios. So if I take this approximation, and I implement it for a standard for Markovian model, so let's say your Heston model, and I do the same for the fractional version. Basically, the ratio um, here is between one and, uh, no, sorry, is this one, uh, rough Donska, the red slash compared to Markovian, the ratio is basically a order two. So meaning that using, using these random walk approximation, again, in some very particular way of defining it, the computation time is twice as slow, which actually is not that slow. Um, and the other thing, this is uh, the one thing I, the one reason is you can make some very nice uh, graphs because once you have random walks, you can actually construct trees. Uh, and of course, trees, there's a big challenge because the trees you get, so these are, these are the trees for the variance process. When H is large, when H is small, you have the trees for the stock price. Again, for some reason, it's not cut. The issue there is that the trees are not recombining, right? Uh, except in the case H is one half, which is the Markovian case. If the trees are not recombining, it means the number of nodes increases exponentially. So there's, there's a trade-off between the computation and time and the memory of your computer. Yeah. But 
So from a theoretical point of view, having trees is nice because if you think of American options, for example, you get the hedging strategies for free. Um, but of course, from a numerical point of view, it's still a challenge. So what we're trying to do, for example, for now, is in the, when you have non-recombining trees, you have a way, there's this very nice paper by Mette Sonner, Jan Dolinsky, uh, where they recombine the trees. So at each point, you can twist things a bit to make it recombining. So we're trying to adapt it here. <coughs> it might work. I don't know yet, but it might work. Uh, but if you have trees, then again, the hedging strategies are, are kind of for free. And I think I'm stopping here. Yes, I'm stopping here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions? Yes. Okay, I, I want to ask about the process of the gamma T when, when you introduce the new one. So yes. You mentioned it as long as a positive and a fine process, but uh, I think you test the calibration by using the levy driven OUSC. But was there any evidence or theoretical discussion that, I mean, it, we are in general continue to see a semi martingale continuous process provide a similar result as in the jump diffusion settings? So, The reason why we took this one is for convenience. And so I agree there's no theoretical, or at least not theoretical, just economic justification as to why we should take this one and not something else. Right? Uh, of course, this one has jumps. That's why we want to try CIR to see if it works or not, because CIR does not have jumps. The only reason, so you know, we, this is a general result. For, for numerical purposes, we took that one because the computation is actually simpler. Everything is explicit, all these integrals, because it's integrals over a finite number of jumps, there are sums, so it's simpler. Uh, now, whether or not this is, you know, you should have jumps. So this is something I'm actually, I've been... Uh, fighting uh, myself in my mind for a long time, uh, especially since we started writing the paper, because the whole motivation of our volatility was actually we don't want jumps, because we don't like jumps. Um, because a lot of people who were motivated by the use of jumps would say actually the short time, of, the short maturity of this queue explodes, so then jumps gives you this uh, kind of explosive behavior. It turns out yeah, you don't need jumps, you, roughness is enough. Uh, but here we have roughness plus some jumps. Uh, so of course it's very uh, torturing for the mind, for my mind at least. Um, so CIR, if it works, would make my mind at ease, and at peace with itself. But no, there's no economic justification for it. If you want to take another one, you can, and most likely... Because I'm thinking, for, for the jumps, we, are, we want more to capture the sudden upward in the volatility, but maybe sub martingale continuous sub martingale models would have the same effect, like similar. maybe. I mean, Damir probably knows that much better, but I've never read a satisfying paper where you know really justifying the jumps for the path of volatility, whether they should be jumps or not. Um, I don't want to offend anyone, uh, but I've personally never been, never seen the, it seems like everything we can do with jumps, it seems like rough volatility can do it. Here we have uh, additional jumps, but that was really for, for um, computational reasons. Thank you. Yeah. Um, in terms of edging, how do you put your hand on the, on the gamma process at the end? Because if you have multi-factor W, you can edge the, the size, so it's, uh, it's fine. So the gamma is independent of W, right? Yes. Right. Um, <coughs> so my first answer directly is, I don't know. That's the honest one. Uh, on, uh... Yes, uh, but I don't know, but 
I think I don't know because we really are not that familiar with jumps. Uh, but the thing is, basically, the jumps appear on the volatility as jumps would appear on the stock price in standard models. So I would say that you you would have similar arguments. No, but yeah, there are two things: the fact that you have um, many, I mean, uh, non I mean, that you have general jumps yeah. of uh, multiple sizes, and, and the fact that you actually add another factor to the dynamic of psi. So imagine that gamma is just a continuous. Yeah. Forget about jumps. Then to get your your hand, put your hand on the on the gamma, you would have to, you need to add some scale. You need to add something, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 I agree. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure what kind of option. I mean, you could say if you add VIX futures. Then what do you mean by like put your hands on gamma? Now you have an additional factor on this factor of gamma. So you, have you have two, two edges. You have W you and uh, gamma, which is to say an ongoing motion. W is fine because you, you told us that you can edge, I mean, you can consider like yeah. uh, an edging instrument, but now you have a stochastic I agree. So, um, um, we haven't looked at the hedging part. But it's really, yeah, it's having stochastic volatility or volatility. But you have options then on, on these guys. Not the same, but you have options on VIX, which is integrated over uh, Over you. Integrated over you. Hold over you, yes, okay. So it's, uh, yeah. Process. Uh, can you show the discretization for the in the end? Uh, for but the first one or the second one? The, the, no, I want the discretization for the fractional... No, no, I mean the, in the, the, a bit more, the second part ah, of the talk. Um, for the weight convergence, do you have it? No. The, the one that you use for... Mod ah, yes, sorry, sorry, in the second part, yes, yes, yes. yes. So, W is a standard variant motion, this is Don's Calamity, right? And uh, you forget about the interpolating term. That's just a random walk here. Yeah. Then, once I have this, I can use this one for the variant motion driving the volatility. Yeah. And then the thing is, you apply the, the, the Riemann Uval integral to this one. So, this is this one, so G alpha is this fractional operator, which turns the brain motion to fractional brain motion, which I can apply directly here, because this is smooth in T. But then in the end, yeah, so the, the question is, in the end you have exactly the same problem, where you actually have to do the computation at every step, taking the whole previous path, right? Well, here... In all the computations. Yeah, or the answer will start at zero. We don't start from minus infinity. Yes, but as you go along, you have to, to take into account everything before. Yes. Yes. So I'm. It's surprising that this does not make the computational time much more than twice. I agree. Uh, I had the, actually the discussion a couple of times with several people because we were not expecting it to work that well. Uh, but. So here we're not looking at options on the VIX, so we're just looking at standard options on the, on the underlying. Um, and we do use a bit like uh, the refinement by Miko, some control variates as well, and uh, a certain number of, uh, of approximations. And you get, I mean, that's one thing I didn't say, but that's one that the convergence, of course, depends on the, depends on the first exponent. And the alpha is the h minus one half. So the, the rougher the process, the slower the convergence, which is kind of uh, intuitively obvious, but you can actually prove it. One, one more simple one. In, in, in the first year you showed when you introduced the gamma, the one with the colors, you said. Yeah, 
Yes, here just so um, the, this one. Yes, so it's a little bit uh, in the second part when you write then xi t of u is equal. Yeah, there should be a xi here. Well, I know I should just start on it. Okay, yeah. yeah, that's no problem. But so this is the, your definition of xi t of u. Uh, no, 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 this is not my definition. My definition, so the sigma is here, and psi t is the expectation oh, okay. of so sigma squared. This is this one. Okay. Yeah, so, so psi to u is the expectation of sigma squared u conditional on the Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? No, so let's say I'm going again. Thank you.